Do you have trouble structuring your projects in Godot? Or do you wonder how you should make your scenes, how you should handle your project structure, your folders, etc., how you should name things? I'm going to give you tips in this video based on my experience, but also feedback from much more experienced developers, things I wish I knew when I started. First, we're going to look at the scene structure. A scene in Godot represents code like a class in an object-oriented programming language. Even if you are using an editor and you have nodes that are here that are not exactly like programming, you can add them through an interface. These nodes represent member variable that you would write by hand if you were using a pure language like C++, Python, JavaScript, etc. These nodes and their hierarchy is a form of programming that we call declarative code. Declarative code is code that represents what you want to achieve, but that doesn't give away the details of how the computer is going to achieve that. When you write a script in GDScript, line by line, you give the computer very specific instructions about what it has to do step by step. But when you look at the scene tree, these nodes, they can do things for you. Take the timer, for example. You can set it to automatically start, to play only one time, or to loop, and to tick every wait time seconds, in this case, every one second. It doesn't need to have a script attached. You don't need to write specific code about it. But more importantly, you watching this scene, you can look at the timer. You know that it's a timer. It's going to act like a timer but you don't know how exactly it's going to calculate time intervals and all that stuff. And that's very powerful because it makes your code and your project self-documenting. You can think about your future self on the one hand, you coming back much later to your project or to some monster or part of the game you have to change and you don't remember how it works at all. You can open the scene, look at the scene tree and if you named and had a good hierarchy, you will have a very good sense of what's happening exactly. So the porcupine has animation player nodes, so it's animated. Collision polygon, it can interact with the world. It has some sprites here under a body pivot node. I use this quite a lot. I actually should name this pivot in that case. It's a pivot point that you can use to move, rotate the monster and everything that goes along with it. State visualizer, it's going to show the state the monster is currently in. It has an obstacle detector raycast node. It's a bit hard to see on the screen, but this one allows it to detect obstacles, as the name suggests. Debug draw, fixed and moving, corresponds to the elements that are currently drawn on screen. That is the detect range for the monster, where it can start to see the player. Next, there is the follow range. This is the limit distance to the player beyond which the monster will go back to its spawn position. And this spawn position and area is the blue circle in the center. And this is fixed drawing, while the other two move along with the monster. Last but not least, it has a direction visualizer here, which is this arrow you can see. This gives you a hint about which direction monsters and entities are moving in the world. While I don't have sprites yet with all the moving directions, it's very handy when you are prototyping the game. But just looking at the scene tree, I have a lot of information about what the monster can and cannot do. And switching to another project using the state pattern, a programming pattern that allows you to break down behavior into self-contained scripts and objects. I have a player here that has a few of the same properties as the monster, so it has some sprites and animation player. But more importantly, it has nodes for its states that represent its behavior. So you can use the scene tree to describe what this character or this entity can do. This one can be idle, moving, or jumping. Later on in the project, I could add other states like attack or something named shoot, create a new script. And when I'm much later into the project, I just have to open this scene, look at the states node, and I know what the character can or cannot do. As far as the names are concerned, I recommend keeping things as simple as possible. 
first do not use redundant names. I had the pivot called body pivot. Then there was the body under it. It's just a pivot, so I'm going to name it pivot. N note that finding good names when you are programming is a skill that you have to learn. It's pretty hard. I try to not use more than two words for anything, be it a node in this case, but also for my project structure. Moving to the project structure, I use folders to separate different unrelated areas of my code. For example, the characters and the monsters in this game have a completely different code base, so they are in two different folders. If I go down the monsters folder, I have two monsters, the mosquito and the porcupine. This project is small, it's for educational purposes, so you won't find a very deep hierarchy of folders, but the idea is use the folders to categorize your codes, your scenes, and to group related elements together. And I really recommend to keep the content of the folders quite specific when you go deep down the tree. So for example, for my mosquito, my flying enemy, I have two scenes, the related scripts and sprites. And if I had more sprites, they would be grouped in a subfolder called sprites, maybe, and nothing more. I could have all the content of the mosquito folder and the porcupine grouped together here. The folder structure is representative of your project's architecture. The next tip is about moving things around and renaming them in your project. Make sure that you do everything from within the file system Docker. So Godot has all the functionality you need to move folders and files. And this is very important because look at my level scene right here. I'm on the game's level and I have a player, a porcupine that I instantiated two times from the file system Docker. When you add these scenes, into another scene, it gets written into your TSCN files, which are text files. For example, in the level, I'm going to have three references to the porcupine itself. If you want to move something and you just drag and drop it on a different folder, maybe Godot will update the dependency paths, but if you use the move to function, you can be sure that it will do so. And also displays your folders as a tree where you can navigate and find the exact folder where you want to move things. So same thing now for renaming, you can use the built in rename functions to do that. And it's going to fix all the dependencies in the scenes in which you've instantiated the element you just renamed. Now I'm going to enter the player scene to show you something very interesting and very important. The player or the character base scene in that case has an animation player with a few animations. You have the nodes on the one hand that add behavior to your game. And on the other hand, you have resources that store data. So when you have a tile set that you plug into a tile map or a sprite that you plug into a sprite node, the sprite, the tile set are resources. They are chunks of data. They don't do anything. Everything like the animations in your animation player are resources. The thing right now is it's not a file in your file system, but I want to show you two things. First, that it's available as text. So let me head to the character folder. I'm going to open the character scene in my file manager and I'm going to open it in my text editor here. If I look here on the line seven, you can find a sub resource of the type animation and you can find all the data for your animation. So you have the name of each animation starting with setup. You will find the various tracks inside of it and the keys that are on each of the tracks. Because this is text, you can copy and paste these chunks of text data and reuse them across scenes. Then what's more interesting even is that instead of using the scenes built in resource, you can create a new resource in the inspector. You can choose a resource of the type animation. And when you do so, you can then use the save button to save it as a text resource. Tires stands for text resource, and you can place it inside your characters folder, for example. 
So this means that you can reuse the resource afterwards across scenes. So most of the time Godot will create resources for you and store them inside of the scene and to reuse the resource you can do what I did here in this project. The player is an inherited scene. You can see that to the grayed out nodes in there. This means that it shares all the original nodes from the character scene in this case. Bouncing back to naming tips, I told you you don't have to repeat yourself with the names. And what I mean by that is, for example, look here. I am in the characters folder and in there I have a sprite that I could call character.png. But instead I'm calling it body.png because from the folder structure I know that this is the character's body because it's in the characters folder. It's a bit different for scripts and scenes. For the scene, I use the same name as the root node of the scene because it's going to be shown in the interface. And it's the same thing for the script. It's important to have a descriptive name in case you'd like to work full screen like that. You can use the F11 key to fold the tabs or the docs on the site. So that's it for the introduction to project structure. We'll get to talk about this a little more in the future, especially looking at how to write your scripts, how to organize them. I had the opportunity to learn a lot from more experienced developers in that regard. That said, thank you kindly for watching, be creative, have fun, and see you in the next one. Bye-bye.